If you haven't been with us in a while, we are deliberately, purposely, looking at the statement of faith of the Evangelical Free Church. When I say we flash back to the high school auditorium, I remember some of the early days where you would introduce yourself as John McConish, pastor of Rock Haven Church, and people would go, oh, that church. <laughs> that church meant those goofy people that met in the school, those goofy people that didn't even have a building. They met, and their office was, well, first in my bedroom. Right? You should have seen the look on the guy's face when he delivered the copier machine to our bedroom. Okay? But then we were in the alley, right? In the high school auditorium, and lots of people, but we started talking about what we believe. And in what we believe, our affiliation with the Evangelical Free Church. But there was a misconception in our community at some, some point, at some place in time, that we were just kind of freewheeling it. That, you know, you say, we're part of the Free Church. They'd be like, oh, do you pass the plate? No, it's free. Right? Or that the idea that we were just kind of, you know, uh, going along, making up our own things. But the, the, the truth is, is that we are part of something bigger. The Evangelical Free Church of America. Who has had its history, right, in many of your lineages for quite some time? Those of you who are Danish and Swedish and Norwegian, right, is where the free church had its origins. And so in the midst of all of those things and in their immigration to the United States, the free church of Norway, the free church of Sweden, the free church of Denmark, merging in 1950 to become the evangelical free church of America. And then, in order to be able to declare to their communities, like we're declaring to ours, what it is that we believe, you create a statement of faith of summary of your biblical convictions. And as we've been saying, what we believe shapes what we do. And so it's important for each and every one of you, right? For those of you who are sending your children out into the world, right? Through college and, and into new jobs. And sometimes that involves new communities and new states and different parts of the United States that they know what we believe. And so that while they're looking for church families to get plugged into, they can look at their core values and their statements of faith to see if they align with what we believe. So it's important. And it's also an accountability. That if all of a sudden John McCosh starts teaching something outside of what we believe, that somebody's there to pull me back and say, hey, do you remember Article 4? Yeah, well, what you're saying doesn't fit what we, oh, 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 right? So we've been going through the statement of faith on purpose, and this morning we're kind of in this in-between. We have, we have looked at the, as Joel shared last week, the incarnation of Christ. We have looked at the sinlessness of Christ. We have looked at all of these facts of Christ. And we're going to, you know, as we move forward, we'll end up looking at Article 5, which is the work of Christ. And right here in the middle, I feel like God's got something that, that uh, it's at least been pressed upon my heart all week. And I want to share it with you in part as we look to both of these in part. Because it's not just about what we believe, but what we do with what we believe. And so in Article 4, it says that we believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, fully God and fully man, one person in two natures. Jesus, Israel's promised Messiah, was conceived through the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, arose bodily from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father as our high priest and our advocate. And that's the two parts that we haven't talked about yet. That Jesus is our high priest and our advocate. In Hebrews, and you don't need to turn there, I'm just giving a long-winded introduction. In Hebrews, it says that Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. I love that verse because two or three times in the Bible it talks about a guarantee. And we live in a world that the guarantees the world offers aren't very good in death and taxes. But Jesus is the guarantor of a new covenant. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, the Bible says that God sets a seal upon us, which is given as a guarantee that we belong to Him. And that's not based on us. A guarantee is only as good as the person who issues it. 
as the company who issues it. And so when we've looked at Jesus, fully God, fully man, incarnate, sinless, the creator of all things, that through him and by him all things hold together, and he himself in all his glory, conqueror of sin and death and risen from the grave, says, I guarantee you, you know it to be good. Former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus, he holds his priesthood forever, permanently, because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God and through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is our high priest who was offered a sacrifice once for all. There is no more sacrifice that is required. And he lives forever. And what he does in that is he makes intercession on our behalf. And what does that mean? We have an enemy who means to steal, kill, and destroy. And what Jesus does in making intercession is to share with us that's the wrong verse to give to us to sustain us as we abide in him when I think of intercession I think about what uh, a conversation that Jesus had with Simon uh, and it's a sign uh, Jesus said Simon Simon behold Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat Jesus is, is, is sharing with Peter a glimpse into a, a heavenly picture. Our enemy, the adversary, the accuser, demanding in the throne room of God to sift Peter like wheat. And the advocate standing in between saying, no, he's mine. Verse 32, Peter, he's wanted to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have, turn again to strengthen your brothers. <laughs> Jesus prays that, that Peter wouldn't fail. And we all know the story, so we're like, well, that didn't work. <laughs> but it is the heart of Jesus that we not fail. And he still gives us choices. And yet in that reconciliation, God is always inviting. God is always beckoning. Right? And that in that, that he would return. And in his return, for it not to be about himself, but that it might be for the benefit of other people. If you have your Bible, would you go ahead and open it up to Colossians? chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse, start in verse 11. Colossians chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 11. I think this is the place to put it. Um, Chris is my witness. She was here this morning as I was organizing the, the top of this counter here. I got more notes than I normally do. Uh, I actually broke out scissors this morning and was cutting paper and trying to tape things in order to make sense. Um, yeah, that linen over our head. Like I said before, my heart and the heart of our ministry isn't for us to be a group of people that collects around ideas that we all agree on. We're, we're, we're not just saying, hey, this is what we believe, and do you agree with me? Do you agree with me? Like we have a club mentality, right? But that we know what we believe and the difference it should make in our lives. 
And it's not the consumption of these things for ourselves. When Jesus said to Peter, I pray that your faith not fail, and that when it does, you'll return to strengthen, equip, help your brothers. To me, is a glimpse into God's very character that he doesn't expect that we're going to be perfect all the time. <laughs> Matter of fact, he knows we're not. But that what we learn about him is meant for the equipping of us to be involved in the lives of other people, both in the church and outside the church. And so Paul writes this letter to the church in Kalos. And what we get is we get that very, that very idea. We, we, we get this, this summation that we are, by our lives, to glorify Jesus, becoming like Him. And with the spirit of thankfulness, we are to be involved in the things that He has done and is doing. That what we experience in Christ, we are called to live out. Look with me uh, at uh, Colossians 3, beginning in verse 11. Uh, and talking about what Jesus has done, and um, if we had more time or if I was more prepared, we'd go through all of this. But he's talking about oneness. He's talking about breaking down divides in communities. He's talking about everything that, uh, that Jesus has done is the guarantor of all of these things. That there is therefore now no Greek and Jew. There's no circumcised and uncircumcised. There's no barbarian and Scythian. There's no slave and free. But rather... Christ is all and in all. There's nothing in our communities today to compare to this list of opposites that existed. The, the absolute uh, uh, animosities that existed between Scythians and barbarians and, 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 and culturally the, the, the nation of Israel and all other Gentiles. Jesus completes, brings together all these things, asking, inviting for us to see our identity not in our previous life group, not in our previous circumstances, but to see by faith our identity in Him. Then, understanding that each and every one of us, as varied as our backgrounds and how we grew up and where we grew up and all those kind of different things, that all of that is gone and the new self is now included in Christ. And then He is all and in all. Just that one little point. <laughs> we, we live in a world today that is wrestling with all kinds of identity issues. Right? Yeah. And I'm not talking about all the ones you hear in the news about, you know, the 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 gender and, and sexual and furry and I, I'm not talking about though I mean yeah that's a big one I mean you can, can uh, just name what you want to be I, I, and the, the list is pretty long and I, but I, I'm talking about just the identity issues right that, 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 that come from broken family and moving and, and life transitions and, and, and people just kind of aimlessly toss here and fro by all kinds of life circumstance. In 2015 there was a study done that said over 37% of teenagers wrestle with identity issues. Now that's, that's 2015. He said, John McCosh, you're not very bright for quoting an old statistic. <laughs> well, let's just stop and think about what's happened over the last seven years. <laughs> Have things gotten better? What do you think COVID did? What do you think all of this masked up society where you can't see and you can't speak? What do you think social media is doing to all of these young men and to adults? The world is hurting, and it's a mess, and it doesn't know who it should be. It doesn't know what it can be, but we do. 
That's why it's called the good news. The gospel. Yet all too often, the church as a whole is really doing good at recognizing the sin in the world. We're pretty good at pointing out what's wrong. Oh, that's... No. <laughs> no. That's not right. Nope. But what we lack is the foresight to engage in a world that will make an eternal impact. Amen. See, and that's, that's why he saved us. Instead of shouting or even trying to legislate, you're bad, you're wrong. What if we could live in such a way that those who are living their lives contrary to God's word would choose to want to know Jesus, to trust him? What if we could live our lives in such a way that the things that they were opposed to, now they're longing for? And they want to know what's different in you. And they want to know this Jesus. And they want to trust Him. And they want to fall in love with Him. And they want to follow Him. And consequently, finding their faith in Him, they find life. Life everlasting, confident, joy-filled, courageous, even in the face of insults, anger, slander, and suffering. And if we could live our lives like that, we too would then in turn find that the hope Peace, joy, and love that is ours in Jesus Christ is growing in assurance and growing in abundance as we grow in Him. Look with me at verse 12. Since Christ is all in all, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Holy and beloved. This is part of our new identity. <laughs> Right? That when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that He comes into your life, that He is your all in all, you are now, therefore, according to God, holy. Set apart for a special purpose. Holy. Um, and purpose. The best analogy I ever heard about that was... Uh, I was, I don't know, I was young in the faith, I grown, and it was a wedding dress, right? A, a young bride, she has her wedding dress, you pull it out, it's beautiful, it's white, and it's set aside for a very specific purpose, right? It's kind of that idea. That, that, that God has set us apart from the world, yet not to be isolated, not to be left un, untouched, unused, unpurposed, but set us aside for a very intended purpose purpose to use us to use us and in remaining holy beloved we are holy and we are beloved what kind of love what is the father loved on us he has loved us with the exact same love of God the father has for God the son that's enough for one week you just ponder that just soak that in the eternal profound and powerful love of God we're supposed to do something with that. We've been set aside. We've been purposed. We've been given a new identity. We're holy and we're beloved. Then, therefore, put on those clothes that match that identity. That's what it is. Put on the clothes that match the job that's set before you. Right? And so he says, he goes on in verse 12, he says, Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if anyone has complained against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. Above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called. And be thankful. Be thankful. Pastors love to go through in their sermons, right? When we find lists, you find a list. Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, meekness, love, peace. And then what they do is they break that list apart, and then they spend all kinds of time telling you about what compassionate hearts or meekness or kindness mean 
in Greek and Latin words. You know what? I think you're smarter than that. <laughs> Compassion, love, meekness, kindness. We don't need a dictionary to know that those things are good. <laughs> right? Those are good. And we're the recipients of those things. Right? Yep. Should we go through the list of some of the opposites? What's the opposite of kindness? Do you, do you want to be encountered with the opposite of kindness? No. If you, you, we, we, want to, we want to engage with people who are compassionate and kind and merciful and loving. And, 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 and we know what that is. And we're so very thankful that God has done that for us. That that's how he engages us. Right? When we look at Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, when we look at Jesus, our good shepherd, when we look at Jesus, the Lord and Savior of our lives, when we look to Jesus in all of these things, we see these perfected. Compassion to the end. Kindness to the end. Patience, oh man, just in John Makasha's life. Right? Yes. We don't need a dictionary to know that these are so very good. But what we do need is a reminder that the good things that we are given by, in, from the Lord are not intended for our consumption but are intended for our stewardship to share in the lives of other people. Did you notice that in putting on the compassion, the kindness, the humility, the meekness, the patience, that those are the clothes that we're putting on, right, since, since our Savior wears them. We're putting those on because we're His. Because we're, we're little. We're like Him. We're His kids. Those are, those are the family clothes. Right? And then we're to conduct ourselves in a certain way. Bearing with one another. That's what you guys do with me. You bear with me. You put up with me. We work together and you're like, ah, oh, it's just John. <laughs> right? It's not the way the world wants to define tolerate. Bearing with one another is recognizing, right, that we each have gifts, skills, and talents, and that we're each called to do certain things in his kingdom. Bearing with one another is recognizing that we have strengths and weaknesses, and none of that's a threat to Jesus. Bearing with one another is the mindset of the believer that says, in my life and in the lives of others, I will always leave room for the work of Jesus Christ. I can't very well demand perfection of you. Right? Unless I myself am perfect. God is perfect. He demands perfection of us. But amidst one of another, we have to realize that we're all growing. And when we're growing, like toddlers, we're going to outgrow our britches. The same times we're stumbling and falling. But God's given us compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience to bear with each other. And you know what you need if you're going to bear with each other? The ability to forgive one another. Right? And that's a big one. It's not just that we're called to forgive each other, as it says in verse 13, but the, the bar set pretty high. It says you're supposed to forgive each other just like the Lord has forgiven you. Well, that's a biggie. That's a biggie. How has is, how is Jesus forgiven us? And you say, well, he's forgiven us completely, perfectly, eternally. Uh, I've heard my personal favorite. And in advance. <laughs> right? You know, he forgave me before I ever knew I needed forgiven. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, that's a high bar set for forgiving. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is laying down your retaliatory right to get even for something greater that you cannot see today. Right? It's a big deal. 
And so God has asked us to do all of these things as a demonstration within the body of the difference that Jesus makes. And in the difference that Jesus makes, our lives being changed, transformed, collectively together, growing up more and more into the identity of Jesus. And it's important, right? Like we said before, that the world that's having this identity crisis at least be able to see that, hey, in light of what God's done for us, we're growing. And we're growing individually, we're growing collectively, and collectively as a church family. The things that mark us as different is our compassion and our kindness, our patience and our love. Peace overflows, overwhelms. And if we're smart enough to recognize that you don't need a dictionary to realize that these things are good, the world recognizes that these things are are so very good. But they have objections. In the midst of those objections is where we find our next call. Okay. I saw a sign this week I saw a sign this week being held up by a protester. Okay? Big, big sign. This protester is holding up a sign and it says, There is no greater hate than Christian love. Just stop and think about that for a minute. There is no greater hate than Christian love. And your mind starts thinking. Right? Now, maybe some of you, the very first thing you're thinking is, well, that's not true. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. <coughs> but the fact of the matter is, that's what somebody else is thinking, saying, holding up. Now, do you think that their part, right, that their identity is where Christ is in all and, and, and through all? And do you, do you think that they, that they really know the love of Christ? Hmm. Well, now we got to start thinking a little bit different, don't we? Because as we interact and engage here, and you tell me you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and I tell you I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we've got some expectations of each other. Of how we ought to show compassion. How we ought to forgive one another. How, I mean, Lord knows how long I've had to bear with Brad. <laughs> <laughs> but where the hope comes from is that Brad's put his faith and trust in Jesus. And I put my faith and trust in Jesus. And we haven't always done it perfect. But to his glory, things are going, right? I say that to Brad because he is the easiest guy. <laughs> but the world... The world doesn't know that. You see, when I first read that sign, my heart broke. My heart broke because immediately I knew that that individual had been the recipient of some pretty hurtful things. You know that old saying? I do love you. I just hate the sin. Many of us have said that. I am less worried about arguing about the Christian isms, Calvinism, Arminianism, postmillennialism, premillennialism, all of those isms, and more and more concerned about how we can engage a world who's holding up those kinds of signs. I think. God's given us the answer when we realize that what he's given us in our conduct of one another is exactly the conduct he wants us to take into the world. Above all these things put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called and be thankful. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, If you love those who love you, what benefit is it to you? So, and I strike that too. If you're compassionate, kind, patient, and bear with one another who love you, right? Who are doing the same things, what benefit is that? That's how you're supposed to act. But I tell you the truth. 
Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is it to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those for whom you expect to receive, what credit is it to you? For even sinners give back to sinners the same amount. But I say love your enemies and do good and lend and expect nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. Be merciful as your Heavenly Father is merciful. When we look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, we don't look to just see the facts of who he is. The facts are what we've been looking at. The facts are recorded for us. The, the life he has lived is the life that he calls each and every one of us to live. Like in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man did not come to seek, excuse me, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Or in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, the second half of that, to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, we have compassion, we have compassion, we have kindness, we have humility, patience. We have all of these things that God has given us, and He's given us this fantastic environment to begin to put these things into practice. But if we're going to say that we are followers of Jesus, then our lives should be marked by and like Him. So we too are called to seek and to serve and to sacrifice. Someone said to me, I shared this idea. I shared this idea earlier in the week. I said, wow, well, he didn't just come to seek. He, keep, he came to seek and save. And I was like, yes, he did. Ladies and gentlemen, I hate to burst your bubble, but there ain't anybody in the room right here that can save a soul. Amen. There ain't a single one of us that has the power to rescue a soul from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. There isn't any one of us that has the ability, the knowledge, or wherewithal to be able to rescue from the depths of a person's inner being all of their demons and slay them and transfer them into the kingdom of light. That belongs to one person. That's Jesus. Okay, so let's leave the saving up to him. Well then, what's the part we can do? We can seek. What's seeking? Well, that's compassion. See, I, th I, I think compassion is having the eyes of Jesus. To see when a person holds up that kind of sign that they're hurting. And we hurt too. What's serving? Huh? What's serving? Serving is where we begin to put into practice meekness and kindness. Remember what Jesus said in Luke? You don't do anything. You don't lend. You don't give expecting anything in return. You just do it. Because that's how they're going to start to know and trust. Sacrifice? Thank God that Jesus gave us the ultimate sacrifice. But he also said, if you're going to follow me, you need to pick up your cross every day. Right? There's got to be some offering. There's got to be some giving. Instead of finger pointing, to come alongside, to invest, to share, to answer, to remind. And there, by love, we begin to impart the good news. It's not going to be received well at first, but now you have the opportunity to minister the truth in love. If the accountability is our willingness to seek, to serve, and to sacrifice, expecting nothing in return for ourselves, but that God would be glorified. You know, Jesus said that, excuse me, uh, God's word says that love binds everything together. As Mariel brings her team up, that word love is as misunderstood in our world today as the word friend. Okay? So every once in a while, I like to go back in the analogs of history. You know what we call that? 
the King James Bible. And when you read the King James, there are certain times in Scripture that the word love isn't actually translated love like we have. It's translated charity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, that's translated charity. Here in Colossians chapter 3, love in the King James Version is translated charity. And in this season, it was just at Omics, there were some pretty good bell ringers, right? We see the Salvation uh, Bucket, or Salvation Army Bucket there, and we think charity, we think of a few coins in a bucket. That's not charity. When the Bible uses the word love, when the Bible uses the word charity, what that is, is our wanting better at the expense of ourselves. That's what it is. To love someone. No greater hate than Christian love. We're going to fix that. I want better. It's going to cost us something. I want better for you. It's going to cost us something. You want better for each other. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you some of you. Your time. Your hurt. Your willingness. And since He has done all of these things for us, you think we can do the same? Imagine a group of people collectively that are willing to seek and to serve and to sacrifice because collectively they want better for the world and are willing to give of themselves. That's charity. I'd like to extend that 